Constant and reliable coverage for amateur voice, data and television QSOs over the whole of Africa, Europe and the Middle East, and even as far as Brazil in the West and Thailand in the East. Dom Smith, M0BLF, is based near Cambridge and has been a keen radio amateur since he was 14. He has used the COVID-19 lockdown period to achieve his ambition to complete a station to work QO100. And this evening we're going to see how he did it and later, hopefully, see it live. So let's meet the man behind the project. Welcome to Tonight at 8, to Dom M0BLF. Dom. Hello, and uh, thanks very much for joining me. I'm out here in my garden in Cambridge, and I uh, have to say the weather is completely against us. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be like this uh, in the middle of, or at the end of July, should it? It, no, absolutely not. It's been actually the last two hours or so it's been dry. I decided to take the risk of doing an outdoor QSO and suddenly it's gone completely black here. So uh, hopefully we'll be OK. Um, but I'd least say the first part of this video is at least pre-recorded. So if I have to dive for cover, that should be OK. Um, so, yes, as you said, during the lockdown period, I put together a station for QO100. It's something I'd sort of been building up the parts with over the last sort of um, nine months or so. I just never got around to actually putting it all together, so uh, I had a bit more time during the lockdown, so I decided to uh, to build up the station. Now, this is a station only for the narrow band, the voice part of Q100, and more on that in a little bit of time. So, so yes, as you say, I put together a video, oh, uh, probably beginning of beginning of April, once I'd got the station together, a bit about uh, how I put it together and what equipment was involved, that sort of thing. And uh, that's what we're going to be showing you tonight. So uh, as you said, this is the video. Hopefully, weather permitting, there'll be a live QSO uh, immediately after that, this. That'll be brilliant. So I hope you enjoy it. All right, then, Dom. Just before we see Dom's film, though, a reminder that if you're watching this on Monday, the 27th of July, then this is live. And you can ask questions and add comments at any time on either BATC or YouTube during the film or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and your call sign if you have one. And also please note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or clicking on the full screen button. But now let's see how Dom M0BLF makes contact with QO100. Hello everyone, I'm Dom M0BLF and some of you have been asking me about the equipment that I've been using to experiment with the QO100 satellite recently. So I thought I'd put together a little video to explain what I've been doing. But before we get stuck into the equipment, let's go inside and uh, have a little look at some of the theory behind the satellite. QO100 is an amateur radio satellite launched at the end of 2018 and which has been operational since February 2019. Now, of course, radio amateurs have been building, launching and communicating via satellites for decades. So what's novel about this one? Well, it's in a geosynchronous orbit. All previous amateur radio satellites have been in low Earth orbits, which means they rise and set and you have to track them across the sky. Often they'd only be above the horizon for perhaps 10 minutes or less. Q100, on the other hand, is geostationary meaning that it appears to be in the same point in the sky all the time because it follows the Earth's rotation. Geosynchronous orbits are really expensive. Slots are limited because there's only a small belt where you can put the satellites and consequently there's high competition for them. All the broadcast and other commercial communication satellites all want to be in a geosynchronous orbit because, well, you wouldn't want to have to have a motorised satellite dish on the side of your house and even then to only get TV pictures for a few minutes every couple of hours, would you? So how has QO100 got one of these precious positions? Well, QO100 is actually a couple of amateur transponders that are carried on a commercial broadcast TV satellite known as SHAL-2. It's a satellite that carries a lot of TV programmes to the Middle East operated by the state of Qatar and it's Qatar that's allowed amateurs to add a couple of extra transponders to the satellite and indeed the QO in the name QO100 stands for Qatari Oscar. You'll remember that all amateur radio satellites are called Oscar, orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio. One of the results of being in a geosynchronous orbit is that the satellite is extremely high above the Earth's surface 
giving a massive covering range, coverage range extending from the tip of Brazil, covering the whole of Africa, Europe and the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent and even as far as the west of Thailand. There's even a QO100 station near the coast of Antarctica. Now all of that coverage is accessible from a relatively simple setup and without the vagaries of HF propagation. By the way, if you're watching this from North America, sorry, you don't get to play with QO100, it's below your horizon. It's Hail 2 and the QO100 transponders are located at a position known as 26 degrees east, which is to say if you were standing at the North Pole, standing on the Greenwich Meridian, the satellite would appear to be 26 degrees east of south. 180 minus 26 is 154, so the satellite would appear to be in, at an azimuth of 154 degrees from the North Pole. Here in the south of England, near the Greenwich Meridian, it's at an azimuth of about 147 degrees. Now, as I've said a couple of times already, there are actually two amateur transponders carried on QO100. One of them is the narrowband transponder for voice and for narrowband digital communications, and the other is the wideband transponder for digital amateur TV signals. The principle of operation is the same for both, but as you'd expect, you need rather more power to use the wideband transponder, which I don't have, so I won't be covering it today. For both the narrow and the wideband transponders, they act similarly to crossband repeaters. The uplink, what you transmit onto the satellite, is at around 13 centimeters, so around 2.4 gigahertz. The downlink, what the satellite transmits back on, is on 3 centimeters, so around 10.6 gigahertz. Now those bands sound scary to an HF operator by, like myself, but the useful thing is that the 2.4 gigahertz frequency is similar to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so there's loads of common equipment that can be repurposed. And similarly, 10.6 gigahertz is near enough the 11 gigahertz downlink frequency of broadcast satellite TV, so we can repurpose equipment there too. In fact, the main piece of gear you'll need is the 13 centimeter transmitter, but that can be easily and fairly cheaply sorted using an SDR or software defined radio. Make sure you get one that's capable of transmit at 2.4 gigahertz, as some only go up to 1.5 gigahertz. And I'll be showing you how I'm using the Lime Mini SDR in just a moment. Unlike amateur repeaters that have a single input and output frequency, the QO100 repeater it repeats a whole chunk of spectrum, 500 kHz on the narrow band transponder and a whole 8 MHz on the wide band transponder, which means many QSOs can happen at the same time. On the narrow band transponder, the band plan resembles that of an HF band plan, with CW at the bottom, then data modes, then SSB, and then there's this mix mode and special purpose section at the top of the band. Please note that no transmission should exceed the 2.7 kHz bandwidth of a standard SSB signal, so you shouldn't be using AM or FM on the satellite. The low and the high ends of the transponder are marked with a beacon, and you obviously shouldn't transmit outside the frequencies contained between these two beacons. The higher beacon may change mode in the future, it's actually an experimental beacon, the low one is CW. In the middle of the SSB band, there's another middle beacon, which is the PSK beacon. All three beacons have a 5 kHz guard band either side of them, so you shouldn't transmit immediately around the beacon frequencies. The PSK beacon is a useful constant carrier source, which we'll use a little later on to stabilize our receive frequency. The PSK beacon also carries telemetry data about the satellite in the same format as that used by the AO40 satellite, so you can use the AO40 receive program to decode it. And it's advised you do periodically decode the telemetry data because the mailbox may contain important announcements about changes to the ban plan or other restrictions in force. You decode the ban plan literally by feeding the audio of the PSK beacon to AO40 receive. The only other thing you really need to know about operating on QO100 is that you need to be able to listen to the downlink while transmitting. Fortunately, that's easy with a setup like mine. 13 SEMs and 3 SEMs are far enough apart that you don't need any special filtering. Although hearing yourself with a fractional delay can be a little off-putting at first, the main reason is to ensure you aren't transmitting too much power. Your signal shouldn't ever be stronger than the three beacons. If it is too strong to the satellite, a siren sound will be injected on top of your transmission, so if you hear yourself coming back with a siren on top, you need to stop and turn down the power. 
Luckily my setup isn't anywhere near strong enough to trigger that siren, but I have heard it on other people's signals a few times. Remember, we're effectively guests on this commercial satellite, and if we don't play nicely, we may not get a similar opportunity in the future. OK, well that's the theory. How do you actually get going on the Kuro 100 satellite? Well, obviously we've got the dish here, but a lot of the magic is actually in this box here. So let's open that up and I'll talk you through what I'm using. OK, so uh, let's uh, talk first of all about how Receive works. Um, receive is probably the simplest thing to get started with. You don't even need one of these big 90 centimetre dishes. A uh, 45 centimetre mesh dish is absolutely fine for receiving here in the south of England. So uh, the first thing is um, you need one of these, which is a standard domestic television LNB. Um, the purpose of an LNB is normally to take the satellite's signal. Domestic satellite television tends to be at about uh, 11 gigahertz and what we want to do is to take that down to uh, about 900 megahertz for domestic television which is going to be a lot easier to send down coaxial cable. Your losses are not going to be anywhere near as high. Uh, fortunately the downlink from QO100 to about 10.6 gigahertz is within the range of most of these LNBs more or less and we can then just get the signal down to about 730 megahertz. Now I should say that everything I'm showing you here is just one way of doing it. It's absolutely possible for example to modify the LNB uh, and get it down to the 70 centimeter amateur radio band instead um, but I'm using a line mini SDR which means I've got frequency agility. I can very easily just tune into the 730 megahertz where the LNB is coming out. What I would say is if you're getting one of these, um, make sure you get a PLL LNB. Uh, there are a couple of types out there. Um, for domestic television, it doesn't really matter how frequency stable the, P uh, the LNB is. Uh, the, carry the transponders are very, very wide band, very, very strong. And so frequency stability is not a major issue. When you're tuning into an SSB signal or a CW signal, PSK signal, your frequency stability is much more important. So a PLL LNB is definitely what you want. So uh, normally your LNB would be mounted about here at the focal point of the dish. Um, you'll notice that mine is actually back here. Um, we'll come back to the reason why, but effectively that is just a standard domestic television LNB. And the coax that comes out of it um, is, uh, is bringing me the QO100 signals at about 730 megahertz, as I say. So inside my magic box of tricks, let's uh, follow what happens to that signal. It's coming in on the coax here. And the uh, first thing it hits is going to be this thing here. This is a bias T. And all that's doing is that's uh, supplying the 12 volt supply up to the LNB. The LNB is an active component and needs uh, 12 volts. The RF is just passed straight through the bias T. So that's now going to go into the input into the Lime Mini SDR. Um, you'll notice I've added some heat sinking onto this Lime Mini and there's also a fan back here as well uh, and that's because the Lime Mini can get very very hot if it's working particularly on a transmit. The receive signal is then uh, just sent down the USB cable. Where's that gone? It's down here, uh, down the USB cable to the software for decoding. Now this is a USB 3 cable, um, gives much higher bandwidth than USB 2, it's what the Lime Mini SDR uses, but uh, you do need to be aware that the maximum length of cable uh, that's specified in USB 3 is uh, 3 meters, so uh, that's going to limit where you can put your laptop relative to your dish, um, although obviously there, there are ways around that in terms of, uh, of sending USB over things like IP. That's kind of out of scope for the moment. So uh, that's, uh, that's all there is on the receive side. Let's take a look at the transmit side. And again, the basis of it is again the Lime Mini SDR. That's going to be doing our transmission. Coming out of the TX port here into this uh, piece of cable along here. And that then goes into these uh, two, one there and one there, um, little driver boards. These are FP SPF. 5189Z chips, uh, very very cheap on eBay 
and uh, they're specified in theory up to four gigahertz. So these are just gonna take uh, the 10 milliwatts or so that comes out of the Lime Mini SDR and just bump that up to about 150 milliwatts, which is enough to drive our main amplifier. So these are um, require five volts. And the rest of this circuitry basically is a 12 volt circuit. So we've got a voltage regulator, where's it gone? Back here. Uh, with a big heat sink on it which is going to um, to supply the five volts to those two um, driver boards now uh, one thing i got wrong when i first started uh, playing with this kit is i started off by using an automotive step down transformer from 12 volts to 5 volts yeah not not recommended the um they're not quite good enough for this purpose and uh, my signal ended up with all sorts of sidebands and uh, nasty effects on it uh, and uh, looking at it in, the, in an oscilloscope was uh, quite scary so uh, definitely want to use a decent voltage regulator for five volts and uh, thanks to m0wut for uh, pointing that out to me so anyway the signal once it's come out of the uh, the last of these um of these step down of these uh, driver boards goes into this piece of coax which then on the lid of the device just for cooling reasons uh, goes into the side of this now this is marketed on ebay as an 8 watt wi-fi amplifier now two things with that uh, first of all uh, it's not 8 watts uh, we've had it open uh, the uh, the bits inside it um, maximum it could possibly do is 2 watts and uh, you wouldn't want to use this uh, on Wi-Fi either. It's uh, not going to be type approved. And uh, particularly in Europe, it's, uh, it's not advisable to use that on Wi-Fi. The other thing to know about these is although they're very cheap, uh, because they're designed for Wi-Fi, they have a very, very, they're designed for a very fast transmit receive changeover cycle, which isn't really suitable for use with SSB and CW. So easiest thing to do is that there's a very simple mod you can do, details in the description below, where you just put a small, small solder bridge between two pins on one of the chips and uh, that will lock it permanently into transmit, which is absolutely fine. You know, SSB and CW, there's not going to be a signal there if we're not transmitting. So uh, we can lock the amp permanently in transmit. Signal then comes out of the amp on this piece of coax. This is going to be your main piece of coax going to your dish. So um, you want to have make it A, as short a run as possible. Uh, we're at 13 sems here and we've only got two watts. We don't want to be losing very much power, so keep it short and uh, decent quality coax. Well, uh, this stuff is uh, CRF200, um, which is, uh, is a Chinese clone of the LRF200 and, uh, and fairly decent stuff. It's uh, still though, the 1.25 meters I've got here has a loss of about 0.55 decibels per meter. So I'm still gonna be losing probably about half a watt or so of power by the time it gets into the antenna. So talking of the antenna, let's uh, take a quick close up of this antenna. It's a, it's a potty antenna, as it's known, it's a patch of the year antenna. And uh, let's uh, take a quick closer look at how that works. Okay, so here's the potty antenna, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert by any means on these microwave antennas. But uh, so this is my understanding is that this piece here is the driven element. The piece behind it, so this piece here, is the reflector. And the not quite circular cutout of the metal is what gives us the circular polarization that's needed for the satellite. Uh, this piece, by the way, is just a lens to help focus uh, for the waveguide going back to the receiving LNB. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the red bits are here, and also there's a, a red holder that's uh, just uh, holding the waveguide into the LNB holder. Uh, these are 3D printed. Uh, there are designs out on the internet, thanks to Rob M0 VFC, who uh, put together the 3D prints for me. Now, one thing I should say, just from a safety perspective, is uh, that I wouldn't want to be standing right here when I was transmitting. Now, this, as I say, is a 90 centimeter dish, and the uh, two watts that's uh, produced at the patch antenna, by the time it hits this dish, which has got a, a a gain of about 26 dBi. Uh, we're going to be looking at about 500 or so watts of ERP that's going up into the sky. So uh, fortunately it's got a fairly high angle of takeoff, um, which means that 
by the time you get to the other side of the road it's going to be way above the, ha uh, the tops of houses but uh, I wouldn't want to be standing right here as I say. The other thing I should mention is that uh, by the time you're getting up to dishes of this sort of diameter the larger the dish the slightly more difficult it is to get it exactly bang on where the satellite is. It is just a pinpoint in the sky. So uh, if you've got a 45 centimeter dish, it's going to be quite easy to find that signal. Uh, it's not quite so uh, so directional. Uh, these big diameters, uh, certainly if you're getting up to uh, the sort of 1.2 meter di diameter dishes, which you're going to need to do, uh, if you're going to get onto that wide band transponder, then uh, you're going to be needing to have very, very precise uh, alignment of your dish. Now, one very annoying thing to just be aware of with these uh, Wi-Fi amplifiers is that uh, like most Wi-Fi equipment, they on one side use reverse polarity SMA. So this is the normal uh, RF input to it. And that is a normal SMA socket. So that's a, an SMA female. It's got the socket. It's got the thread on the outside uh, ring. Whereas on the other side, the RF outside, uh, is a SMA, uh, a reverse polarity SMA or RP SMA. This is actually the female RP SMA. It's got the plug in the middle, uh, unlike what you'd normally find with a, uh, a female. So this is an RP, a reverse polarity, but it has that screw thread on the outside as well in the female really important to be aware of this um, it completely threw me at one point when i tried to connect together a patch lead one uh, for a female sma into a male sma rp sma and uh, the result was that there was actually no central connector at all okay so i've now come back inside and we're ready to start setting up the uh, lime mini sdr with sdr console so to do that, first thing I'm going to do is to click on Definitions and then search for my Lime SDR. It has been found, that's good, so we'll add it to the list. Now, I could just leave it like that, but if I do that, I'll have to keep track of three frequencies at all times. There'll be the 3 centimeter downlink frequency, there'll be the frequency I need to tune into, which will be after the LNB has down-converted it to about 730 megahertz. And then there's also my 13 centimeters uplink frequency. That's quite a lot of frequencies to keep track of at all times. So it's a lot easier if SDR console can just show you the 3 centimeters downlink frequency. And that's the only one you need to worry about. And we can do that using this converter selection option. So we'll turn that on. And you see I've already set this up here. Now the TX side, we're going to need an RX and TX one. The TX side is the easy one. 8.089.5 is the TX frequency. That is the uh, that's the offset between the 13 centimeter uplink frequency and what it then comes back down on on three centimeters. The RX converter is the offset, which is your local oscillator frequency of your LNB. Uh, this can be a little bit variable. It tends to be uh, 9.750.2 or 9.750.0. As you see, mine here is 9.749.9. .9. As I say, it is variable. Uh, the only way you can actually find this out is trial and error. So what you'll need to do is when we come on in a moment to uh, synchronizing to the geostation to the PSK beacon, um, if you don't see the PSK beacon come up in the bottom half of the screen when we do that, that will select, suggest that your local oscillator frequency here is wrong. You'll need to come back and change it. So let's uh, save that for now. And we'll uh, save that. We'll select the Lime SDR Mini. And we need to select a bandwidth which is capable of transmit because we want to be transmitting. Uh, the Lime Mini SDR only does 750 kilohertz bandwidth on transmit. So we'll go with that. So let's uh, click start. And hopefully the rig should be found and SDR console will start receiving signals. As I say, I'm not actually uh, plugged into anything here. I'm, I'm inside, so uh, we don't actually expect to receive anything. A couple of other things we need to do to get SDR console ready to receive on Ezhale. 
and the first of those is that by default uh, it will only it can only display frequencies up to 9.999 gigahertz and of course we've got a 10.6 gigahertz downlink frequency that we're interested in so we need to add an extra digit that's uh, very easy to do uh, you just go to view and options and then on the spectrum tab just allow a frequency range up to 99.9 gigahertz that will add an extra uh, digit on the next restart next thing to do is we currently don't have a transmit panel uh, so we wouldn't be able to access any of the transmit features uh, we do that just by going to transmit and then to DSP and that's brought up our transmit um, our transmit panel so just to show you around here we've got on the left hand side we've got our receive frequency uh, we've got the, uh, the sound card that's being used to receive signals and we can also set the modes and the filters that we are interested in on the transmit side uh, we can we've got the transmit frequency we can optionally choose to synchronize that with our receive frequency you've got uh, transmit mode and again you can synchronize that so it's the same as your receive mode then you've got the TX button which is what we'll be actually using to transmit with and your drive you'll want to, to turn the drive up obviously to get any RF out down here is where we'll select the microphone we're going to be transmitting with uh, so that's um, got us our transmit panel and um, the last thing to do is we'll need to synchronize our LNB with the geostationary beacon on the satellite and to do that we go to the view tab and to the select more options uh, icon and we're going to need to turn on the geostationary beacon now when I click OK it'll want to restart the software uh, so that it can add that extra icon to my toolbar to allow me to do that geostationary beacon synchronization so let's click OK and restart so the program's now restarted I've got my geostationary beacon icon here and I've got the additional digit uh, for the gigahertz uh, that's available to me so it uh, looks like we're all ready to go let's uh, go outside and wire it all up we'll need to uh, connect in of course the laptop a USB headset and uh, of course we need to put the bo top on the uh, box of, uh, of equipment as well so now we're going to need to correct any drift in the LNB and the way we're going to do that is by locking SDR console to the PSK downlink beacon that beacon in the middle of the SSB spectrum so I'm going to click on this on the view tab on the geostationary beacon and what you get here is another little block opening up at the bottom of your screen which includes hopefully you'll be able to see fairly obviously the uh, PSK beacon it's uh, here at about 7489800 for me if we now press the play icon over here that will now lock everything and you'll see that on the top half of my display all the frequencies have shifted this now means that my frequencies are corrected uh, for the drift of the LNB and as long as nothing drifts too far that will now stay locked and so that's Q100 in a nutshell if all of this sounds interesting but a bit too much investment right now a great place to start is the British Amateur Television Club's web SDR that allows you to listen to the satellite via the web without spending anything you simply connect to a receiver at the famous Goonhilly Earth Station in Cornwall in southwest England. And finally, of course, a massive thanks to a whole load of people at AMSAT, particularly AMSAT Germany and the state of Qatar, who've all made QO100 happen. I've been really enjoying the satellite and I hope you do too. Well, that was uh, Dom, as you know, on a film. And uh, I'm pleased to say we can now go back to Dom, looking slightly more nervous this time, but with his equipment outside his home in Cambridge. Dom, hello. Hello. Yeah, the uh, the weather has just about held off for us. Um, a few a few nervous moments with the uh, with uh, spots of rain, but and the beautiful rainbow I'm going to go actually. But I think well, I before you do that, if I can just remind everybody at home, though, uh, if you have got a question you haven't asked it yet, yet either on YouTube or on BTC. This is the time to do it because we'll put your questions now uh, to Dom. Uh, but now we're going to go back to Dom and then I'll read you a few questions, Dom. But first, we want to see this transmission before we get the rain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a really good idea. So uh, first of all, I should say um, 
the amount of equipment I've got here, this isn't normal. Uh, normally, I'd just be using a simple, straightforward USB headset. Um, uh, unfortunately, what I'm trying to do right now uh, is really quite complicated from an audio point of view, because I've got to send the audio to you and to the satellite at the same time. The audio coming down from the satellite's got to go to you. And anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's from an audio routing point of view, it's quite interesting. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that, is, that is why I have all the equipment here. So uh, it's going to change to the other camera, which means that you might then be able to see me. And I think we found the first example of something that's uh, fallen victim to the rain, possibly. So uh, uh, never mind on that one. Yeah, no, that's not working. So never mind. Um, we will carry on. Apologies for the slightly weird camera angle. That's OK, uh, so Don. We can see you fine uh, there. Be, you can see me fine. That's yeah. good. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, go over here. And uh, joining me on this link should, in theory, be uh, John G4BAO. And it sounds like he's actually just finishing QSO with someone at the moment. So whilst he finishes off, um, what I'll say is that um, when when I go live on here, um, what you'll hear is you'll hear me going up on the uplink, but you'll also hear me coming down about a second later or so, uh, coming down on the downlink. And as I said in the video, that's actually a desired effect. We want to be able to hear ourselves coming back on that downlink. Um, do, do you so, call in John now in the same way as you would on a radio and you give his call sign and then yours? Exactly. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. M zero BLF uh, for you, John. Uh, G4 BAO, G4 BAO, Mike zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot for you. Uh, G4BAO, G4BAO, Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot for you. I heard him there a moment ago. Uh, G4BAO, G4BAO. Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot for you. Oh dear, I think we've lost you, um, Dom. I'm not quite sure what's happened there. Just to give you a clue, Dom, if you can still hear me, I hope you can. Can you? Dom? Yes, I can still hear you. Dom, yes. I, we've lost um, your camera picture, to be honest. It, it started wobbling. I didn't want to interrupt you, but now it's gone yes, completely. Have, yes. So yeah. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but in the true nature of live television, that's what's happened now. But I'm sure that uh, Dom is now going to try and put the camera back up. And uh, as you could see, probably, there's quite a lot of wind there. We had a few issues with... Um, sound earlier this would be good time and we've got your camera back there dom before while dom's just sorting that out though it'd be a good time to tell you about dom's website because you'll be able to get a lot of information about the equipment and everything else that is used and uh, you should be able to now see that on your screen i believe now yes here we go m0blf.org.uk so if you check that out you will find lots of information about the equipment and everything that uh, dom has been using tonight and I say we really have uh, I have great admiration and sympathy in, in equal measures for you, Dom, because uh, I could see it getting windier and windier. And uh, yeah. as I didn't want to put you off because you were just talking to John and uh, and the wobbling of the camera worried me. So uh, anyway, I know you're just setting up a, an umbrella there, uh, which I can that's, see. That's exactly it. Uh, hopefully. OK, we can go back now to have a look at you, John. And uh, I think, yeah. So but you can see. Um, I'll let you know if, so, if we get any more moments like that. But anyway, hopefully you'll be able to get John back. Over to you. Yeah, G4 BAO. Oh. 
It's okay, I can still see you. <laughs> uh, key for BAO. I don't know if this helps you, Dom, but uh, John is saying he's calling you now on, on via YouTube. He's actually talking to you on YouTube as well. Yeah, G four B A O, G four B A O. Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot for you. Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot. Copy. Can you give us a bit more volume as well, please, Dom? Yeah, go for Bravo Alpha Oscar from Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Foxtrot. Uh, all copy, John, all copy from you. And uh, thanks very much uh, for the sked this evening. Uh, not going entirely according to plan, mainly thanks for the weather. But uh, I think uh, I think we've given all the viewers at home uh, an idea about uh, the QO100 satellite. Uh, so thanks very much, John. And uh, seven three for me in the Juliet Oscar zero two Bravo Golf. Seven three, John. Can you just turn the volume up a bit, Dom? Of uh, John. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much, John, and uh, good to work you this evening. Mike Zero, Bravo Lima Fox, now going clear. Well done. If we had a crowd here, Dom, we would give you a big round of applause for working through that. <sighs> Um, that was um, yeah, that was that was a bit harder than it should have been. I know. Uh, no, don't yeah. worry. It, it shows it's live and everything, and everybody will respect that. I think you probably need to remove your uh, umbrella a little bit. They've come to me now. The pictures are from me. Um, so just to let you know, if you've just joined us, uh, that we've just experienced a live transmission via QO one hundred that Dom has had with his friend uh, John. And uh, he's now just resetting his camera because the uh, weather just outside Cambridge there is rather adverse. It's been getting worse the last hour or so just before we came on air. Um, we were a bit nervous, but I'm really pleased uh, that you, you made it, Dom. And uh, that's added a lot of authenticity to tonight and uh, all of the, the film that you gave us as well. So we have got some questions for you. And when you're settled um, and uh, if you feel it's safe to do so in terms of the weather, um, then uh, maybe we can ask you those questions but only when you feel confident and if it does rain start raining please don't worry and let me know and we'll come back to us and, and let you cover up all that equipment <laughs> that's fine no, no uh, absolutely fine uh, all okay now thanks all right jolly good well I'll start with some questions then let me just find them here um, one of the questions was the size of the dish I think um, a meter dish or an old sky dish is that going to be okay uh, yeah, so this dish here actually is a, is a 90 centimetre dish, a 90 centimetre dish. Um, perfectly okay for SSB QSOs. If you want to use the, the wideband transponder, the video transponder, then you're going to need uh, probably getting on for 1.2 metres, something like that. Um, for receive, a simple sky um, mini dish, the sort of 45 centimetre jobs, absolutely fine. But for transmit, you really want sort of 80 or 90 centimetres in the south of England. If you're further north, uh, maybe going up into Scotland, then you'll want to be over a metre. Yeah, I think that used to happen as well when, when Astra and, and satellites like that, that started, didn't you? You had to have a bigger dish the further up the country you were. Yeah, that's exactly it. So you're obviously getting that little bit further away from the, from the equator, from, from the spot beam. Okay, jolly good. Um, we've got a question now on uh, BATC from G7JTT. That's John. Um, says uh, He s said here, jo change over to 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi for home use, as you may find your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi may not work. Yeah. Um, ideally, if you're running a very local transmitter, like I've got one just literally perched under the dish there, the uh, the Line Mini SDR, going just up into the dish and then the dish is firing the 2.4 gigs off 
straight to the satellites. It shouldn't be a big issue. But yes, if you've got a, a 2.4 gigs uh, uh, transmitter in the shack, then obviously you're very, very close to the 2.4 gigs that's used by Bluetooth and Wi-Fi as well. In that case, you may want to use uh, the alternative Wi-Fi band, the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi band, if all your equipment uh, supports it. Not all equipment does. Some of the older stuff doesn't. Okay, jolly good. By the way, we had a, a Max Goodall who said to you, he's watching a morning from NZ, which I would take it to be New Zealand, unless there's another place in the Britain that I haven't th thought of, which uh, is uh, from NZ. So you're really, you're showing the world oh. what you're doing. Oh, oh we've just lost the um, camera. Okay. You've just lost the camera again. We have. Fine. That's okay. all right. We're, we're not watching at the moment. Although I have a feeling that good. these sort of films, you know, if you send them off to a certain program, you might get £250. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, that is definitely not meant to happen. Um, okay. We'll come back to you now. We can we can yep, we can good. see you fine now. Your camera's uh, rested there. Yeah. Um, satellite. Uh, John has helped to answer some of these questions um, during the film. Um, Paul Thanks, Graham has asked, "How do you align the dish? Is it a case of slackening a U bolt and spinning it, or is there a more granular way?" Uh, simple answer is trial and error. Yes, um, slacken the U bolt, move it around a bit. Um, Really helpful the fact that this, this satellite is only two degrees uh, different. Dish, uh, that's about to go again. Um, the satellite is actually only um, uh, only about two degrees away from where the um, the sky satellite is at 28 degrees east, and uh, so it's really uh, not too difficult to, to get it uh, roughly aligned. And then you just trial there just a little bit at a time and hopefully you get in the right place. Uh, the beacon, obviously a line on the beacon, and it should be fairly easy. It's a quite a loud satellite on, on receive. Okay, jolly good. I've got another question here from Paul Graham. Yes, uh, on YouTube this is, yes, I meant for the actual adjustment, though, and there are things, or maybe he'd asked a question earlier. Uh, sorry about that. They, they are jumping around a little bit as we're getting... Uh, quite a few questions um yes there's uh some of these are answers i think to your questions actually um satellite finders usually get swamped by one of the adjacent astra satellite signals that was john in answer i think to somebody earlier do you have any other tips um that you might give for, for lining up the satellite uh not really no as i say it, it's it is um you can get satellite finder apps on phones. They will, again, help you get roughly in the right place. But for that final bit of alignment, it is a matter of very fine adjustment. Watch the beacon frequency. Watch your SDR receiver software and just try and peek it on where that is the stronger signal. OK. Uh, Kelvin uh, G1ZSE has said he's interested on uplink power and the dish size balance. Yeah. Um, so I'll say what I'm using here is nominally two watts or thereabouts and um, a, a, a big load of loss in the feeder going up to the uh, up to the potty antenna and then got the the big dish giving you all that gain um, it's really a matter of practicality as much as anything else if I um, and, and expense you know this is this is really the, the cheapest way of doing things or one of the cheaper way of doing it if you wanted to get into this properly yeah, you know, you can go out and, and buy a, a Kuno Electronics uh, 20 watt amp or maybe even a, a 50, 80, 100 watt amp. Um, perfectly reasonable things to do. And obviously at that point, you can start bringing the dish size down a little bit. But uh, most of the most people even operating at the higher powers do tend to use large dishes as well, just to, just to make them that little bit louder. Sure. Um, we've got a couple of questions now, the same sort of question, really. One from Graham, G7 LMF, and the same sort of question from Pete, 2E0 PCO. Basically, what sort of costs are involved, they're asking? Right. I reckon I so tossed it up. I reckon that excluding the Lime Mini SDR, because obviously, obviously that's the expense of it, that's going to set you back in the region of £300 or so. If you exclude that, and your SDR is obviously then usable for multiple other things. So that's a reasonable thing to exclude. The rest of the kit, I would reckon I put together for about maybe 150 quid. It's not that bad, you know, 40 quid for the dish. Um, and uh, then you've got the, the box of components. Um, each of the little components, you know, that, that's the, the driver boards, the, uh, the bias T, each of them like five or six pounds each. Um, then you've got the Wi-Fi amp for about £40. So it's, it's actually a, a very achievable thing to do. 
Good. I mean, I was going to ask you a, a broader question, really. In the last few months in particular, there's been a surge of amateurs coming into the hobby thanks to remote invigilation by the RSGB. And for some of them, I guess they're going to be maybe some of the younger members as well who've not got the facilities to have long HF aerials and things like this. Would you say that this is a good aspect of the hobby to get into where you don't need large gardens for lots of long aerials? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, I, I did hear an M7 uh, station on Cure 100 the other day, so someone who's very newly licensed. Wow. Um, it's very achievable. It's, I, I'm, I'm, oops. Oh, there we go again. On again. <laughs> Caught it in time. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a, um, an HF operator by, by background, and um, whilst I'm used to sort of propagation, the vagaries of, you know, you may not be able to get to a certain part of the world at a certain time of day, that's not something that's very easy for beginners or, or not very um, useful for beginners to get get used to. So, um, so I think from that, in that regard, it's it's a really great asset to Cure 100 because it really can start uh, using the satellite very easily. Yeah, I get. I, you know, by the way, I've thought of another hobby for you. If you're looking at that weather, maybe you should take up sailing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um we've got a, a question here um more of a problem uh this was actually john in reply i think to what you said was more of a problem i guess for di digital amateur television as more power is needed yes absolutely um that is um you know as, as soon as you are on um on television the bandwidths are that much larger and um yeah you're going to have to have to have that much um that much higher power so yeah you will be wanting to to use the bigger amps for for television if you want to get into that. that's why i don't do any here right dan gd zero vik has said how quick can alignment be is this feasible for portable work on a tripod uh right i've actually changed camera now uh that should be easier um save me having to catch it um so portable work and tripods there are people who do that um that is absolutely something that that people do um they um in fact, there have been some. Uh, another thing that I'm interested in actually is, is summits on the air, SOTA, and there have been some. Some people have taken dishes to the tops of hills uh, to to operate to summit to summit even. So, again, very easy. Um, uh, well, no, if if you're able to carry the dish, it's easy enough. Um, the equipment is actually quite portable. You know, I've been able to to rig a much more complex setup than a, a standard portable setup out here, sort of in the space of an hour or so this evening. So um, yeah, you can you can do it portable, absolutely. Um, and power power requirements not that bad. Good, um, John, your friend who you were talking to on QR100 says that he's using a 1.2 meter dish. There, uh, he can do SSB with just a few watts and digital amateur TV with 40 40 watts. Right. Yeah. So that's um, that that gives you a sense of it. As I say, I'm I'm using um, uh, two watts and an 80 sem dish for SSB. 40 watts and, and 1.2 meters then for, for uh, digital SS, the digital TV. So you do just need that, that bit more power. Good. We've got uh, DE2 TRF says RSGB and all radio amateurs worldwide. I find you all mega super cool, all radio amateurs in the world. So that's very nice. Um, Excellent. Uh, small dish alignment, 45 centimeters alignment is very easy, says John. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the big the bigger the dish, the um, the harder it is to get the alignment precisely right. If you're on forty five centimeters under the sky mini dish, you'll find the satellite really very easily. Actually, yes, got a great point here as well made by Mike G Zero M J W, who says that it even works for DX if your QTH QTH sorry is below sea level, of course. Yes, yes, um, and there have been uh, have been some uh, some very interesting long distance QSA is made like that. I haven't gotten the example to hand, but yeah. And on uh, it says uh, John G7JTT came back and said, on DATV we have most of Europe, Russia, Israel, Mauritius, South Africa, China, Brazil and India. Yep, and we are starting to get some de expeditions as well uh, operating on QO100. So some of, the, some of the rare countries as well are, are there. Not so much on DATV, but, uh, but it's certainly, you know, it, it's as easy to operate on Q100 from anywhere as it is anywhere else, you know, if you like. So um, being in a rare country is no particular disadvantage. Mm. Andy Cowley has uh, said uh, a caravan dish works great for SOTA. Yep. Yep. 
And in fact, the, the tripod I've got up here is exactly a, a caravan dish. Um, I, I actually started off, I did actually start off using a, uh, uh, a 60 cent dish, I think it was, um, when I first made some QSOs on it. They were very, very weak. I did manage to make a couple of QSOs, very, very weak. Um, the 90 centimeter dish makes it just a little bit easier. And uh, Q, uh, D2TRF says QO100 FT8 or FT4 is cool as well. So you can do everything, I guess, over this. You can, you can. Um, and there are there are parts. Of, it's got a fairly standard band plan, as I mentioned in the video. And you can, um, you know, you, you could, there are certain parts of the band plan which are allocated for these, uh, these narrow band digital modes. And of course, repeaters and other groups like that emerge, are encouraging always these emerging technologies, aren't they? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just while I remember it, there's one thing I should uh, correct from the video, um, which is that all the way through, I was merrily saying that the downlink was on 10.6 gigahertz. It's actually nearer 10.5. Um, doesn't make any difference to, to the content of the video, though. So finally, then, we've got your website to go to um, to find out these sort of equipment yep. and things that you've used. Any other places that you suggest and advice that people could go to, particularly in a time when we can't have many clubs operating and things like that? Where else would you suggest that people go to find out more about amateur satellites? Um, I mean, there's obviously the, the AMSAT uh, websites. None of this would have happened without AMSAT, particularly AMSAT Germany, um, really good organisation, the, the amateur satellite organisation. So they have the the list if you like and all the details officially on amateur satellites um the other place i'd, I'd look for information on q100 is of course on the batc website there is the um the sdr uh, you can uh, tune in as i mentioned in the video you can tune in and listen to the downlinks and that's a really good place to start to just get to grips with what sort of things you can hear on the satellite Great. Yeah, we've just actually put the caption up as well for BATC because we'd prepared that just in case. Uh, we've got a message now from 2E0LQJ. It says, does the software only work in Windows or are there, is there Linux software? Uh, there is Linux software. Um, I believe there is some level of supporting GNU Radio. Um, uh, I, I haven't really investigated it myself. OK, fine. Well, I think we're pretty much there and um, I think we should let you go and put your equipment away before it, it blows away or gets <laughs> rained away. You've, yeah, been, I've, you've been a great sport tonight to do this, Dom. I, I tell you, I, I know that um, when we did a tech rehearsal a few days ago, we said, well, if, if the weather's right, we'll do it. And then when I contacted you a bit earlier in the evening, we're going to give it a go. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. So um, we're very, very grateful for you doing this tonight. And uh, once again, yep. thank you very much for joining us on tonight at eight. Uh, no worries. And uh, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I hope, uh, hope everyone's found it very interesting. And uh, do, do let me know if you've got any, other, any further follow-up questions, anything like that. Uh, you can get to me via my website, m0blf.org.uk. Brilliant. OK, thanks very much, Dom. Take care. Thank you very much for that. And that ends tonight at eight. And on your behalf, as I said, I'd like to thank our guest presenter, Dom Smith, M0BLF, for sharing his fascinating project and answering all your questions, of course. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's Tonight at Eight. And if you'd like to see details of future webinars or send any comments or feedback, please visit www.rsgb.org forward slash webinars. But until next time, this is David G7URP signing off and clear. Bye bye.